Okay. Uh, thanks again. You know, I wanted to make a comment about how this conference is going. And one of the really sort of great aspects that is occurring is all of these sort of issues that are being raised in the Q&A and in chat during the talks. I think that's really great. You know, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to foster online uh, mathematics communities and interactions. And somehow this community here is doing a, a really great job at the back and forth and the engagement. And that's, um, and, and, and that's terrific. It sort of, sort of warms my heart to kind of see that kind of thing happening, happening online. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we did last time on Tuesday. So I talked about the stable homotopy groups and why they're important. And one of the main ideas that I um, that I emphasized last time was what you see right at the top of the screen, this conclusion that the stable homotopy groups are more than groups. They're more than a ring. They're, um, they have this higher structure that's indispensable that you, that you simply have to pay attention to if you really care about, about the details, okay? And we talked about motivic homotopy and we talked about some constructions of motivic homotopy um, elements, okay? And then we dove into the, um, the, the setup of the atom spectral sequence, okay? And so there was a sort of formal way of producing a filtration in the spectral sequence. But what really kind of mattered in the end was what you see now at the top of the screen, that first of all, there's an E2 page that's in, that um, you can write down in terms of X groups over the steam right algebra, okay? Which is entirely algebraic object. Okay, and that there's this three-step program that first you have to compute the X groups, the algebraic X, group, X groups, that's the E2 page. Then you have to analyze the atoms differentials in the spectral sequence. And then finally, you have to interpret the, the final answer by solving hidden extensions. Okay, so we talked, um, we already started talking uh, last time about how you go about computing X groups. Okay, and I showed you some charts of what these sorts of things end up looking like. Okay, and we started talking about the Kobar complex, and this is where I'd like to pick things up from uh, f from last time. Okay, so uh, first of all, we've got this Kobar complex here that I've written down. It's a polynomial algebra in the zetas. Okay, and remember it's a hop algebra, so it's got a product and a coproduct, and there's a coproduct formula over here on the right. Okay, one of the things that um, we're going to need. Uh, about this Kobar complex is we're gonna need to study the primitive elements. So a primitive element means that the coproduct is of the simplest possible form. Your coproduct of an element is that element tensor one plus one tensor that element, okay? And it turns out that zeta one, two to the n, those are precisely the primitive elements, okay? So then the Kobar complex looks like this. There's a little F2 in degree zero, okay? And then there's a copy of A bar, that's the augmentation ideal of, oops, you know what, I'm missing a lot of stars here, right? A bar star is the augmentation ideal of the dual steam right algebra, okay? And then there's the tensor powers of A bar in higher and higher degrees, okay? And there's a differential, right? This is a differential graded algebra. There's a differential here, okay? And this first differential is, is just given in terms of the coproduct. Okay, the higher differentials are also in terms of the coproduct. They're kind of like an alternating sum type formula in terms of the coproduct, but we're not gonna analyze these in any detail, but we will take a, a brief look at this first differential here. Okay, all right, so, but we, we're working here with the reduced, right? Sorry, with the, with the augmentation ideal, right? Which means that these one tensor um, terms disappear. Okay, and so the, uh, the, the boundary map, the differential on a primitive is zero. Okay, and so these zeta one, two to the n's, these are cycles, okay, in the homology of this Kobar complex, all right? And again, that's precisely because they're primitives. Okay, that's exactly what this formula is saying, okay? And the typical name, typically we take this, so here's a, here's a you know, here's, here's a cycle in the homology, and we call it HN. That's what the HN is, you've probably heard at, at, at some point or not, you've been to a talk or, or studied something, you hear about these HN elements and this H1, H2, H3, H4, and this is what they correspond to. Okay, these zeta one, two to the n's, okay? So that's fine for H1, okay? You can get H1 pretty naively just by looking at the Kobar complex, okay? And then you wanna keep going, right? And so the next thing to do is to think about H2, right? Of this, uh, of this complex here, right? You wanna look at cycles, modulo boundaries, you know, um, in, this, in, in this degree here, right? But that turns out to be not so easy to determine by hand, okay? This is not something you can simply do by brute force directly with the Kobar complex. Well, I guess you can, but it's a tremendous amount of work. Okay, 
And one of the problems with the Kobar complex is that the dimensions grow exponentially, right? Because you're taking these tensor powers, right? And so the dimensions are growing very rapidly. The Kobar complex has great formal properties, okay? But it gets very hard to compute with uh, once you get into higher degrees be, because it's, it's really kind of like the wrong model, okay? There, for com machine computation, there are smaller minimal resolutions that you can work with, right? But the Kobar complex is not one of them. Okay, all right, so I want to, um, we're gonna spend some time playing around with the Kobar complex today because I think that, you know, picking up these elements and, and handling them yourself and getting a feel for how things work really gives you some, um, some, some valuable experience and some insight into how things work in higher, um, in higher dimensions as well, okay? Um, and, but before I do that, I wanna dive into this, this topic of Massey products, okay? So I've been referring to this higher structure, higher structure, higher structure for, um, you know, uh, throughout these talks. And I wanna actually make specific what kind of higher structure that I'm particularly interested in, okay? There's lots of different ways of expressing higher structure. I use Massey products in total brackets because I find them to be useful for the types of computations that I wanna carry out. Okay, all right, so okay, let's start with a general setup. Okay, let's start with a differential graded algebra. Okay, and this differential graded algebra, so let's make it over F2, okay? It doesn't have to be over F2, but there are minus signs there are th that you have to deal with and the, and the formulas involving the degrees get complicated. So rather than having to write plus or minus all the time, I'm just gonna have work over F2 where plus one equals minus one, and I don't have to worry about those minus signs. Okay, that's, that's, the, only, that's the only reason I'm working over F2 here is just so I don't have to deal with minus signs, okay? So you have a differential graded algebra, you take the homology, of that, uh, of that object, and what you'll get is another algebra, okay? The Leibniz rule is essentially what guarantees that there's a mult, that the ring, that there's a well-defined ring structure on the homology, okay? But it's not just an algebra, it doesn't just, it's not just a ring, it has this higher structure in terms of Massey products, okay? I'm gonna break down for you what this really means, okay? So let's start with three elements, A0, A1, and A2, in the um, in a and I guess we want to assume that they're cycles okay so the different D of each of them is zero okay and let's assume that their products and I put bars over these things right because now I'm looking at their um, at the at the homology classes that they represent right a, the a little a's are in capital a the a bars are in the homology right so in the homology these products are zero okay so a zero a one is zero and also a one a two is zero in the homology, not necessarily in A, but in the homology, okay? So here's what that means, right? The fact that the, the, that the product is zero in homology means that A0, A1 is hit by a differential. That's exactly what it means to be zero in homology, okay? So you choose an A0, one that hits A0 times A1, and you choose an A1, two that hits A1 times A2, okay? You can, you can do that basically by definition of uh, these conditions, okay? And then you define the Massey product of these three homology classes to be the set of all expressions of the form A01, A2 plus A0, A12, okay? So this looks like some sort, of some, some sort of complicated formula. Where does this come from, right? So over here on the right, I've sort of drawn a schematic for how I, you know, in practice on scratch paper when I'm competing Massey products, this is how I draw them, right? I write the three elements, this is the Massey product that I want to compute. Underneath A0 and A1, I write the, the, the element that hits the product. Underneath A1 and A2, I write the element that hits that product, right? And I've got this little diagram here, and then I kind of cross multiply and add, okay? So that's kind of how I keep track of things. The nice thing about that picture is that it generalizes to higher products. We're not going to talk about them, but there are fourfold and fivefold and n-fold Massey products, and you just have to make sort of bigger triangles bigger lattices of, of things hitting other things in order to compute those, um, those higher Massey, Massey products, okay? All right, so one way to think about what this, this Massey product is, is measuring, right, is that look at this triple product, A0, A1, A2, right? This triple product, A0, A1, to A2, is zero for two different reasons, right? It is zero because the first two elements multiply to zero, and then when you multiply with A2 bar, you still get zero, right? It's also zero because the last 
asks two elements multiplied to zero. And then when you um, pre-multiply by a zero, you still get zero. Okay, so there's two different reasons. Okay, and what and and those two different reasons are are the two terms in this formula, right? Here's the reason when the first product is zero, using the first product is zero. Here's the reason where the last product is zero, right? And you're adding them or taking their difference, uh, and and that's the Massey product. Okay, and this is a common theme in homotopy theory, right? When you when when something is zero for two different reasons, typically you assemble them, you put them together, or right? you look at their difference, and you get a higher order invariant, right? Okay, so one of the difficulties in dealing with Massey products, and one of the, the things that say students when they're learning learning about this, not exactly well defined operations. Okay. Uh, uh, for, first of all, they're only defined when these two conditions um, happen in the first place. Okay, but even worse, they're um, they're not well defined in the sense that you don't get a single element in homology. You get a subset. I wrote subset here for a reason. You get a subset in the homology. Okay, and the reason you get a subset is that there are some choices here. You have to choose an a zero one, and you have to choose an a one two. Okay, and if you make different choices, depending on the specific properties of the computation at hand. Um, if you make different choices of A01 and A12, you can end up with different elements in the homology. Okay? And so what we say is there's just some indeterminacy in these total in these massy products or total brackets, okay, sometimes, depending on, on the specifics. Okay? We're not going to um, see any of that in these talks, but it's just an important thing to keep track of. And inevitably, like all of the most sort of or yeah, the, the most famous or important mistakes in say the computation of stable homotopy groups of spheres typically arise because people were it, were not careful about these types of indeterminacies. This is exactly that. This is the most the slipperiest point in this whole subject is dealing with these indeterminacies and remembering to keep track of them. Okay, so that's sort of a warning, but we're not going to really explore that. Okay, what we are going to explore is an extended example. Okay, I'd like to talk about this Massey product h0 comma h1 comma h0 in in the in the cohomology of the um of the uh, uh of the steamer algebra okay so there's a question the question is no. if a dga is formal are the massy products zero yes that's exactly right okay so f a dga being formal means that it's that it's uh that it's quasi isomorphic to a dga in which the differentials are all zero Okay? And if the differentials are all zero, then the only way that a, a product like this could be zero in homology is if the, uh, if, is if the representatives uh, A0 and A1 product were already zero, right? So this product is already zero, and then A01 is zero, and A12 is zero, okay? And so then you end up with zero in, in your Massey product. Okay, so all Massey products, let me rephrase that, all Massey products contain zero in a formal DGA, right? But again, because of the indeterminacy, they could actually be larger. They could not just necessarily equal zero. Okay, another question. Is there a geometric interpretation of these products, for example, the Durham DG algebra of forms? Okay, so yes, there absolutely are geometric interpretations of these Massey products um, in, say, like the cohomology of a space, okay? So one good example of those, that type of geometric interpretation is the Borromean rings, right? The Borromean rings are these three, um, three rings, right, in R3, three loops in R3. They are pairwise not linked, right? So there's, they're not linked pairwise, but the entire configuration of all three rings holds together, okay? Um, and, and so, uh, so when you think in terms of the cohomology of the complement of those three rings, the fact that they're the fact that the rings are pairwise unlinked is talk is is um, interpreted in terms of cup product. There's two. Each of those rings corresponds to a cohomology class, and the cup product of those cohomology classes vanish. That it, it corresponds to is if and only if those links are those 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 loops are unlinked. Okay, so pairwise, the, pro the cut products are zero, but the fact that the Borromean ring configuration does not fall apart is precisely saying that the Massey product of those three cohomology classes is non-zero. It's precisely that condition, okay? Um, so that, and that's a really, really nice interpretation of, um, of Massey products, but it's kind of unrelated to what we're gonna be, be talking about here. Okay, question, when do these, 
um, question, when do these indeterminacies not exist? Okay, so the indeterminacies it always exist in a formal sense. It's just that sometimes the indeterminacy can be zero. Okay, so what's what in, in a little more detail, the indeterminacy is like a subgroup. Okay, and so it's you what you really have here, what what these um, what these Massey products really are, are cosets with respect to some subgroup. Okay, and the indeterminacy is the name of the subgroup that you have a coset with respect to. Okay, it is possible that that subgroup is, is the zero group, in which case we say there's no indeterminacy, but what we really mean, we really mean that the indeterminacy is zero. Okay, so there's a little bit of abuse of, of, of language there. Okay. There's another, are, yeah. yeah, okay, there's oh, another there's question? question in the chat, yeah. yeah. By, uh, Could you explain a bit the Ekman-Hilton duality between Massey products and Toda brackets? Okay, so I'm not sure what that question means, but let me say, um, let, let me give you my answer to the compare and contrast Massey products and Toda brackets. Okay, so Massey products, uh, well, first of all, they're really the same thing. Okay, so if you put these things on the, in the correct categorical framework, you're working here with these DGAs, you're working in some derived, in the derived category of A, right? And these, cold, these homology classes are maps or, you know, or derived maps or something like that, okay? Uh, then a total bracket and a Massey product end up being exactly the same thing, okay? Um, but I tend to think of, of, I use the term Massey products when I'm thinking in this very concrete algebraic type of situation that I have in front of me here. Okay. And I use the term Toda bracket when I'm working in a more homotopical context. Okay. So when I'm talking about the stable homotopy ring, stable homotopy uh, groups have Toda brackets. When the pairwise products are zero, you have Toda brackets, but it's not kind of an algebraic linear case. It's some sort of like somewhat nonlinear, you know, situation with a homotopy category. And I use Toda brackets. Okay. I'm not going to dive into the formal definition of Toda brackets. You can make them work in any, in any uh, triangulated category. I think even, maybe, maybe, maybe even less than that. Um, you can talk about Toda brackets in a triangulated category. Uh, and then the Massey products are sort of like a special case. Okay. So my use of Massey product and Toda bracket is very much cultural, right? It depends on which aspects I want to draw attention to. When I want to draw attention to the fact that these things are algebraic and computable, I'll use Massey product. When I want to draw attention to the fact that they're, that they're expressing homotopical information, I'll use Toda bracket. But and as I say, again, in these talks, we're not really going to dive into the, uh, the, the total brackets much. Okay, these are great questions. I'm glad people are bringing these up. These are, you know, the, I mean, these Massey products are really like at the heart of this whole subject, right? Like what, when I think about, you know, what, you know, what skills I learned on the way to being able to carry out these computations, you know, to a very large degree, it is the um, it is my ability to work with Massey products, right? My, my familiarity with Massey products and Toda brackets that has allowed me to kind of carry out, out these things. Uh, recently, a student referred to my database of Massey products that I carry around in my head, right? And I have all this information. And when I see an element, I can recognize it in those terms. And it's a really, really sort of useful for getting at, get, getting at all kinds of stuff. Okay. So, Let's talk about an example, okay, H0, H1, H0, okay? The product H0, H1 is zero, okay? And so this, this, these pairwise products are zero, okay? Which means we can at least write down this Massey product, okay? In the cohomology of the Stewart algebra, okay? Let's go through how you might actually explicitly compute this Massey product, okay? And we're gonna use the Kovar complex, okay? So H0 is another name for zeta one, right? Zeta one, we've talked about, this is a primitive element, right? And H0 is the name of the cycle that zeta one represents, okay? And H1 is represented by zeta one squared, okay? Now, rapidly, you're going to see that the notation is going to start devolving into imprecision, right? Technically, um, you know, I can't, I'm gonna talk about zeta one as if it is an element, as if it is a cycle, an element in X. Well, technically zeta one, it represents H zero and, you know, and I don't need, do I need to put bars or brackets around zeta one? Well, I'm gonna sort of drop a lot of that extraneous notation because it just gets too cumbersome, okay? So we've got zeta one and zeta one squared. Okay, and I'm just re rewrote the Kobar differential that I had written on a previous slide just so we can see it in front of us. Okay, all right, so now I'm gonna write down a few, I've written down a few of the, uh, the specific 
uh, co-product formulas that we're going to need. Okay, the reduced co-product on zeta two is of this form, zeta one squared bar zeta one. Okay, and here I'm writing tensor, and here I'm writing a bar, and that's just sort of tradition, right? Traditionally, in the co-bar complex, we use these bar symbols instead of tensors, but it means the same thing. Okay, so that's the reduced co-product on zeta two. Okay, and look what that's saying. That's saying, look, zeta one squared, that's H1. Zeta one is H0. So this co bar, this, this co, this, this co product right here is telling you immediately that H1 times H0 is zero. Notice the order here, right? It's H1 times H0 is zero. Okay, so this is already sort of relevant to what we want to do. Okay, now here's another co product on zeta one cubed. Okay, if you look at zeta one cubed and you look at its reduced co-product, here's what you get. You get zeta one squared bar zeta one plus zeta one bar zeta one squared. Okay, and why is that? I wrote, wrote over here in green a little bit more about how you would actually do this, right? So zeta one cubed is zeta one times zeta one squared. Okay, and the co-product is a ring map, it turns out. So you can, you can break it down this way. Here's the co-product of zeta one. Here's the co-product of zeta one squared. Remember, these guys are both primitive, right? So we know they're co-products. Okay, and then you've got four terms here, right? Two terms here, two terms here. You've got four terms all together, but, um, but two of them are the one tensor, the element, and the element tensor one, which we, got rid, which we get rid of, right? We're looking at the reduced coproduct. And the mixed terms are these two, okay? So that's where this formula came from, right? It's the sort of like the two cross terms, right? In, at least in American schools, we often talk about FOIL, right? First, outer, inner, last, right? And so this is the, um, the, 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 the outer and the inner are here, right? And the first and the last are kind of like, you know, reduced. Okay. All right. So what does this say? This says that, well, we've got H1 times H0 plus H0 times H1, right? This is telling us that H1 plus H, H1, H0 plus H0, H1 is zero, okay? Which is also useful to know. And together with this formula, that's telling you that H0, H1 is zero, right? Because these things aren't necessarily commutative. And I mean, X over the theorem of algebra is commutative because some, because some of, because of some additional, um, additional, additional a, a outside fact that I haven't talked about. We already know that the cohomology of the Steenward algebra is commutative for other reasons that I don't want to get into, okay? But, um, but here we're explicitly showing that both products in both orders are, are zero. Okay, all right, so those are the cobar, um, uh, th those are the cobar differentials that we're gonna need, okay? So now let's set up the diagram that I talked about earlier, right? Here are the three elements whose massy product I want to compute. There's H0, there's H1, and there's H0, okay? And here's the element that kills um, zeta one bar zeta one squared, right? It's the sum of these two, right? The sum of these two kills zeta one, zeta one, zeta one bar zeta one squared. On the other hand, it's zeta two that kills zeta one squared zeta one, right? And you can see the non-commutativity of the cobar complex is really kind of key here. It's really showing up, right? In, in, when, you, when you change the order, it's a, sort of, it's a different thing, right? Okay, so the cro you cross multiply, right? And so the massy product is supposed to be zeta one, zeta two, zeta one bar zeta two, right? Plus this guy, right? Which is zeta two, zeta one, plus zeta one cubed bar zeta one, right? So that's what I've got here, right? So this is what the massy product is supposed to be, okay? But there's a problem. We look at that thing and that doesn't, we can't recognize that as the cycle. What is that thing, right? That doesn't look like any kind of expression that we recognize these zeta twos in there. I mean, and the, the zeta ones are supposed to be H zeros, but the zeta twos aren't permanent cycles and the zeta one cubed is not a permanent cycle. And so what does this really mean, right? So what we have to do is we have to rewrite this thing, find something that it is cohomologous to or homologous to, I guess, something that it's homologous to that's sort of in a better, more useful form. Okay, and so, but so this is the this is the expression that we're supposed to be working with, right? Okay, and so what is that? And we got to go a little bit further to understand that here. Okay, so in order to understand this thing, I'm going to look at one more um, co-product. Okay, on zeta one, zeta two. Okay, and when you look at the definitions and you work it out, you get these four terms. You get zeta one bar zeta two, zeta two bar zeta one, zeta one cubed bar zeta one. That's the same as these three, but then you get one more term, which is zeta one squared bar zeta one squared. Okay, and where this, where this comes from, the way to compute this, just like before, to compute, you compute the unreduced coproduct on zeta one, zeta two, using the ring structure, you get six terms here, two of which are the, you know, are, are reduced when you look at, the, uh, um, when you look at, 
at, get you get rid of when you look at the reduced coproduct and four of which survive okay and those are the four here the zeta one squared zeta one squared for example comes from this term one tensor zeta one times zeta one squared tensor zeta one right those two together give you that fourth term for example okay so what this is saying is that this expression these three terms that we computed as the massy product are homologous to this fourth term right because their sum is a boundary right and so this massy product is then also detected by zeta one squared zeta one squared bar zeta one squared and that we can recognize as h1 times h1 or h1 squared Okay, so there it is. There's a non-trivial Massey product in, you know, in, in something, right, that you've seen now, okay? And as I mentioned earlier, it's really key that the, so the non-commutativity of the cobar complex is really kind of key here, right? That zeta one bar zeta one squared is different than zeta one squared bar um, zeta one, okay? Um, and Sean uh, Tilson raises a great question. Is it obvious that it is an equality instead of an equals? Okay, uh, what, sorry, is it, is it obvious an equality rather than an inclusion, right? And the answer is that it is, uh, that it is not obvious, that Sean's instinct is absolutely correct, that you don't stop here, you don't say, ah, oh, H1 squared, I'm all done. You always have, you have to train yourself to always ask, is there indeterminacy? Do I need to worry about that, okay? And then it turns out by inspection in this degree that there is no indeterminacy. Okay, but it's it's a totally valid question. Okay, so you're gonna have to go on a, you have to go ch check that separately. Okay, um, so the another question: Why do some of the terms disappear when you pass to homology? Okay, so I think what you're talking about maybe is why we had these three terms here, and then we reduced it down to just one term here, right? And the point is that these we're work, when we're working in homology, right? We're working modulo boundaries, right? So these this the sum of four elements is a boundary. Right, and so therefore, these three elements are equivalent to this one element. It's not so much that uh, from the six-term expression. Oh, okay. So here, why do two of them um, go away? Two of them go away because we want the reduced coproduct. The reduced coproduct means that you should not pay attention to the to, to the one tensor x and the x tensor one terms. Okay, and the reason that you ignore those two terms if you go back and you look at exactly why the cobar the, the way in which the co the homology the cobar complex is x you're very careful with the details on why the you know on how the cobar complex is a resol is a free a resolution of f2 and had in and how you hom into f2 and then take homology to get x and you you go through that sort of carefully through that homological algebra story you see that you need the reduced um, you, you, you need the reduced Cobar complex, okay? Okay, so that's why you're dropping those, those, uh, those terms there. Okay, uh, question. Can you convince a computer to go through this sort of computation or is the homologous replacement a limiting step? No, the homologous replacement is not a limiting step, okay? Um, you absolutely can train a computer to do these comp types of computations. What you need, what you do, what, the way you train a computer to do this is you put an ordering on all of these different terms and all these monomials. And so, so that there's sort of a preferred form for every homology class. And then when the computer gets something that isn't in reduced form, it it, it always re puts it into reduced um, preferred form first and then it compares it, okay? And this is, um, you may have heard the expression a Curtis table, okay? A Curtis table is kind of, is sort of a way of organizing this type of kind of choosing a canonical, well, it's not a canonical, but choosing a preferred representative of each homo homology class. It's very much related to that kind of, kind of thing, okay? So um, the, the issue with a computer, a computer can do this one just fine. The issue with a computer in the Cobar complex is in higher degrees where it just grows exponentially and you just get out of the linear algebra becomes unmanageable rapidly. Okay, so we did that one by hand, okay? That was not a huge amount of work, but it was some work, right? And that's just this tiny little thing about like, you know, about, about pi two, right? H1 squared is about pi two, right? So it's not something we wanna do a lot of, right? If we can avoid it. Okay, so what I want to talk about is a better, more efficient way of carrying out these types of computations of X groups. Okay, and the uh, the kind of like the the philosophically speaking, it's like the best, the most efficient way for humans to think about X compute X groups is with the May spectral sequence. 
okay? So the idea of the May spectral sequence is to filter the Cobar complex, that's C star, C star is the Cobar complex, filter the Cobar complex by primitives, remember, by, uh, by this sort of thing, okay? And, um, and then when you do that, Okay, you, so you, you choose, basically, you're choosing some filtration on the Cobar complex, okay? And then E1 is the associated graded of that filtration, right? And then there will be a spectral sequence converging to what you want, okay? So it turns out that the, the E1 page is really nice. It's just a polynomial ring on certain elements, Hij, okay? And Hij corresponds to zeta i to the j. Okay, so we talked about the H and H1, H2, H3, H4 before. Those course, in this notation, those are H10, H11, H12, H13, and so forth. Okay, but there's also ones involving zeta 2 to powers. Okay, these guys themselves are not primitives, but the, the idea is that they are primitives modulo primitives, right? And so what you're, what you're really doing here, well, with sort of any time you filter, right, is you're working with the Cobar complex, but you're sort of working modulo higher order terms, right? And that helps you kind of keep track of the details. You ignore the distracting um, technical terms, and then, and, and then, you, and then you work in a, in, in a much simpler algebraic uh, setting, okay? And this is um, and in, this is this is a highly effective process. Okay, it's been done by hand to seventy steps. Okay, Tang, Tangora did this in the classical context um, decades ago, out to seventy steps, and I've done it by hand in the C motivic context out to seventy steps. Okay, but you can't do it forever. Like it, it gets pretty. It, it does eventually get pretty difficult. Okay, but you, there's no way you'd ever be able to compute the Cobar complex to seventy stems by hand. I, mean, I don't even I don't even think you can get to seven stems by hand. Um, uh, seven stems by hand at the Cobar complex. Okay, the X group is spits out is bi graded, so this is a triply graded spectral sequence. That's exactly right. X itself is bi graded. There's this topological degree, and there's also the atoms filtration. Okay, uh, so that's showing up when you think about the Cobar complex. The way that's showing up, say, like in the Cobar complex, where's a little diagram here. In the Cobar complex, there's internal degrees internal to the Steenroot algebra. The Steenroot algebra is already graded, right? Um, square one, square two, square four, they have different degrees, right? And then there's also the homological degree of the Cobar complex, okay? And you have to re-index for an Adams chart, but it's this, there's the two dimensions. There's the two gradings, right, if, of X coming from the homolog homological degree and the internal grading. Okay, but now, so, so the answer is bi-graded, which means this thing is tri-graded. That's right. There's also a May filtration on these guys as well. And that has to do with sort of how primitive these things are. Okay, so the, the things that are primitives themselves, the zeta ones are in the lowest filtration. Things that are primitive, modulo primitives are in the second filtration and, and so on and so forth. So these HIJs have a May filtration and I'm not telling you what those degrees are. Okay, all right. So how do you learn how to compute with the May spectral sequence? Well, the way to learn the May spectral sequence is to study a simple case, okay, involving A of one, okay? So A of one is a small example that behaves, that has, um, it's sort of like the, the first kind of non-trivial example that behaves like the Steenroot algebra. It's got the first complication involving the Steenroot algebra, but only one complication. And so it makes it much more manageable, okay? A of one star is defined to be F2 adjoins zeta one and zeta two only. So no zeta three and higher, those are thrown out. Modulo zeta one to the fourth and modulo zeta two squared, okay? So there are eight monomials here, right? This is an eight dimensional um, algebra over F2, right? Eight dimensional vector space over F2, right? So this is not so big, okay? Um, so we want, what I wanna study is X over A of one, okay? X, X of A of one, X of this much smaller ring, right? Than, than the full Steenroot algebra, okay? That's, that's our goal, okay? And if we learn how to do that, then we'll have learned a lot about how the May spectral sequence works in general. Okay, so when you look at this thing, okay, let's note that zeta one and zeta one squared are primitive, okay? Zeta one to the fourth is zero and the higher powers of zeta, are zero, zeta one are zero, so they're not relevant, okay? Zeta two is not primitive, 
but it's primitive. See, here's its, here's its reduced coproduct here, right? That, that middle term is what makes it not primitive. But it is primitive modulo primitives, right? If you mod out by the primitives, zeta 1 and zeta 1 squared, then the, co the reduced coproduct becomes 0, right? And so that makes it sort of in the second layer, in the second stage of the filtration, OK? All right, and so the upshot of all of this is that the E1 page for A of 1 is polynomial again, but it's only got three generators, okay? So this is H0 or H10 in my earlier notation. This is H1 or H11 in my earlier notation. And this is V1 or H20 in my earlier notation. I'm gonna call it V1 because, well, you know, you hear chromatic homotopy theory or, you know, in nilpotence and periodicity, you hear VP, you hear people talk about the VNs all the time, right? Well, this V1, it, that's, that's, that's that V, right? That, that's really the name that it deserves. It connects to a lot of other related mathematics, but it's also H20. Okay, so there's the E1 page. I drew over here on the left side of the screen, I drew a picture of the E1 page. Okay, so it's a free polynomial in three elements. And when I go through and I check the degrees, H0 is, here's the identity at the origin, okay? H0 is right here in degree 0, 1. H1 is right here in degree 1, 1. And then V1 is right here in degree 2, 1, okay? And then it's polynomial, right? So I have all these multiples of H0. I have all these multiples of H1. I have all their products of H0s and H1s in here, right? So the black stuff, those are all the products of H0 and H1. Okay. And then I have V1, right? But then I have to multiply V1 by all the multiples of H0 and all the multiples of H1. And so, because the picture gets messy quickly, I drew these two little green arrows to indicate a big sort of infinite triangle of H0 and H1 multiples on V1. And then here's V1 squared that again has H0 and H1 multiples and a V1 cubed and a V1 to the fourth and a V1 to the fifth and so forth. Okay. So that's the E1 page with all the degrees put into place. Okay. Now, the D1 differential is relatively easy to compute because you can look it up in terms of the coproduct, okay? The co reduced coproduct of zeta 2 is zeta 1 squared bar zeta 1, and that's saying that D1 of V1, right, V1 corresponds to zeta 2, is equal to H0, H1, or rather it equals H1 times H0. It's really, I, it, but, but we, we, uh, we already know that things are commutative, and so the order doesn't really matter. Okay, so the D1 of V1 equals H0, H1. Let's look at that on the chart. That's this red arrow here. The differential on V1 hits this product, H0, H1. Okay. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, so, so there's a differential in it there, okay. And then of course, all these multiples of V1 hit all these multiples of H0, H1, right? Um, uh, just by, uh, by linearity, right? Okay, and then V1 squared, is a D1 cycle because of the Leibniz rule, right? It, it, D1 on V1 squared involves a two, right? But two is zero here, we're working over F2. And so V1 squared is a cycle, at least for D1, okay? So let's take that picture and let's look at what happens in E2, okay? So remember this differential V1 killed H0, H1 and all of the H0, 1, H1 multiples, right? And so that hollows out the inside of this triangle, right? The inside of this triangle is all now wiped out, right? All that stuff was set to zero, okay? And the green triangle is, has disappeared because none of it survived, right? All of the green elements all supported differentials hitting these black elements. So the green triangle is completely gone. Okay, it's, 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 it hasn't survived to E2. Okay, and then there's V1 squared, and it's got H0 multiples, and it's got H1 multiples. But again, the triangle is hollow, right? Because V1 cubed, V1 cubed came in and hit um, H0, H1 times V1 squared. Okay, so you've got this, this hollow triangle pattern repeating um, on one, V1 squared, V1 to the fourth, V1 to the sixth, and so forth. Okay, so written in term in more precise terms, you've got a, a generators H0, H1, and V1 squared, right? But you've got to kill off H0, H1, okay? So that's what the E2 page looks like, okay? And now you have to analyze the D2 differential, okay? And when you look, when you inspect the degrees, what you discover is that possibly there's a differential on V1 squared that could hit H1 cubed. Okay, so that's this question here. Does, v, does D2 of V1 squared equal H1 cubed? It's possible for degree reasons that such a thing occurs, okay? But just because it's possible doesn't mean that it does occur and you have to figure out how to compute it. So one thing you could do 
is you could inspect the Cobar complex, right? And since we're studying H1 cubed, we can look for Z, zeta 1 squared bar zeta 1 squared bar zeta 1 squared, okay? But that's pretty hard, okay? Things are getting big enough now where playing around the Cobar complex is more difficult, okay? So what typically happens here is that you do something a little bit indirect and ad hoc, okay? And because it's ad hoc, that means that you have to do some work, right? This, this is, you know, um, to, to kind of figure out what's, what's going on, right? And sometimes you have to be creative and, 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 you know, and inspect things and try stuff out, okay? So what I want to use is this Massey product that we calculated earlier, that H1 squared is the Massey product H0 comma H1 comma H0, okay? We did that in X over A, not in X over A of one, but the exact same thing works, symbol for symbol works exactly the same, and you get the same, a massy product in X over A of one, okay? So you have that, okay? So let's look at this string of equalities. Start with H1 cubed, okay? Well, H1 cubed is H1 squared times H1. So there it is, there's H1 squared, but which I rewrote as a massy product, times H1, okay? So far, so good, but no, 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 nothing interesting has happened. Now, the next equality is where the action happens, okay? There is a formal relationship between massy products, right, when you have a comma B comma C and then multiply by D, that always is equal to A times the Massey product of B comma C comma D, okay? as long as both Massey products are defined. Okay? That always works out. That's a formal thing you can do in any DGA. You can, you can prove that those, those, these two expressions are formally equal. Okay, so and I, I would call this a Massey product shuffle, right? So you shuffle this formula, okay, and you get H0 times the Massey product H1 comma H0 comma H1. This is a different Massey product than the one we had over here, okay? And very often something special happens when you shift from one Massey product to another, you can see structure that was otherwise not so, not so obvious, okay? Now, we haven't computed H1, H0, H1, okay? We could go back to the Cobar complex and compute it, okay? And in X over A, this one is non-zero, it works out. Okay, um, but what about in X over A of one? Well, in X over A of one, this Massey product ends up living right there, right where the red dot is. That's the degree in which that Massey product H1, H0, H1 lives. And we can, ins we can see from inspection, there isn't anything there, right? There are no possible non-zero elements. The only element there is zero, okay? And so this Massey product has to be zero, okay? So you get H0 times zero and you get zero. Okay, so what we just did is we, um, we did something kind of clever and not obvious, right? We, we wrote down an expression for H1 cubed using Massey products, we shuffled that, and we proved that it had to be zero, okay? And therefore, H1 cubed, so H1 cubed has to be zero, it must be hit by a differential, okay? And then this is the only possible differential, and we do get that differential. Okay, so this is a really kind of slick argument, right? And this is the sort of stuff that we do all the time in higher and higher, in more and more complicated ways, in higher and higher steps, right? This kind of shuffling around and, and deducing relations, you know, based on shuffles, um, and then which then imply differentials is, is the name of the game. Okay, question, do you have a favorite reference for an exhaustive list of such shuffle and juggle formulas? No, I do not have a favorite reference for, uh, for that. I don't really know of a good reference for that kind of thing. Um, some of these things are written in Ravenel's uh, complex co-borders and book, like maybe in one of the appendices or something like that. Maybe it's not an appendix. Anyway, are, are, some of these things are written in, in Ravenel's book. Um, some of them are written in down in the various sort of like large like you know manuscripts that I've produced on this on on this topic of computing stable homotopy groups, but that's not really exhaustive either. Okay, so I think there's actually a reason why um, there aren't any kind of like you know basically what happens is when someone needs a particular result they kind of write down a proof write down a lemma and then they go and use that result right? and there's a reason that no one has written an exhaustive list of such shuffling juggling formulas and the reason is that we don't really know what all of these shuffle juggle formulas are okay we know examples of them and we can try to apply we can try to extend the, the low dimensional examples we know into higher um, examples, and 
but we don't really know what all the relations are. This is kind of an open question. Um, and I think there's probably some room for some sort of like, you know, operad like, you know, structure here to describe what all the possible operations on these Massey products actually are. Um, it's not something that someone has ever done, but I think, you know, getting at a infinity, you know, a infinity structures are, are kind of related to, to what I'm talking about, but they really aren't, I'm, I'm thinking for of something much more algebraic than just sort of saying a infinity, but, um, but it, this is sort of an interesting question. What are all the, what are all the formulas? So we don't really know. Okay, what do the axes in these pictures represent? Okay, so that's a good question. What do the axes represent? So the, the vertical axis represents the homological degree. Okay, the sort of like the degree of the Cobar complex. If you're in the 19th stage of the Cobar complex, then you'll be up here at height 19 in the picture. Okay, the um, the it, rather than tell you what the horizontal degree means, I'm going to tell you instead what the sum of the degrees means. The sum of the degrees corresponds to the internal degree of the Steenroth algebra. Okay, so H0 here is in, is in total degree one, right? Zero plus one is one, right? And that corresponds to square one in the Steenroth algebra. This guy is in degree, total degree two, one plus one equals two, and that corresponds to square two, which is degree two, okay? Out here, for X over A, not an X over A one, but for X over A out here, you have an element H2 in degree three comma one, total degree four, and that's corresponding to square four, total degree four. Okay, so the vertical axis is the homological degree. The sum, the x plus y, that's the internal degree, okay? But the x degree, the reason we draw these things this way is that the x degree then corresponds to the stem. When you use these things to compute stable homotopy groups, then a column corresponds to a stable homotopy group, okay? So I always index things this way so that we can see the stable homotopy groups e easily, easily. Okay, um, Andy Baker reminds me that Peter May's Matrix Massey Products paper does contain a lot of those formulas. He's absolutely right. That is a great reference for, um, for, um, for the types of formulas that we're talking about here. Uh, even that's not exhaustive, but it is a good place to, uh, to, to look at it. However, you will need to set aside some time. If you're going to look at that paper, you will need to set aside some time in order to familiarize yourself with the technical notation um, for what's going on in that paper. But sometimes that's just necessary. Okay. Thanks very much, Andy. Th thank you for reminding me of that. He's, he, Andy's absolutely right. Okay. All right. So what we did is computed a May differential, D2 on V1 squared. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and Joey Bove Feistower points out that Ravenel's Green Book does have some of these uh, formulas as well. Okay. All right. So now you can go from E2 to E3. Okay. And unfortunately, um, the way these things fit on the screen, I can't really show you both of them so easily at the same time. Okay. So um, what happens is that V1 squared hits that H1 cube. And notice that there's all these H1 multiples of V1 squared. And all those H1 multiples of V1 squared are hitting all these higher H1 multiples, okay? So this whole blue diagonal line doesn't survive, and this whole black diagonal line gets killed, okay? But the vertical line does survive, right? This guy does not support a differential, okay? And so that's what we're gonna see down here, okay? The H1 cubed and higher were killed the blue diagonal line did not survive, but this H naught tower does survive, okay? And then there's V1 to the fourth and the pattern repeats and you'll have an H naught V1 to the sixth and a V1 to the eighth and so forth, okay? Let me point out just as another exercise, right? Um, this H naught V1 squared is an indecomposable in, in, in uh, E3 in terms of the ring structure, but in terms of the higher structure, it has a decomposition as the bracket H0 comma H1 comma H1 squared, okay? And I wrote down here the little bit of the little details that you need in order to compute this bracket. Um, in the E2 page, H0, H1, it was already zero in the E2 page. And so it's, this is just D of zero equaling zero, but H1 cubed is hit by V1 squared, right? And then you cross multiply, right? To get H naught V1 squared. Okay, so that's a little massive product here in, in X over A of one, just as another illustration 
of whether, whether that's useful or not, well, that's another matter. Okay, all right, so there it is. And then for degree reasons, there are no more possible differentials. You can look at all the elements and you can just see that there aren't any possible differentials. And so you must have E3 equals E infinity. Okay, so, the, um, so this story really like, what, on the one hand, this, this A of one is a very sort of easy, is a much easier example than the cohomology of the full Sigmoid algebra. But on the other hand, it also really get, captures the flavor of what's, uh, 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 of what's going on. Okay, there's really a lot of truth to that. If you wrap your head around what all the details of what's going on here, then you're in a good position to study the full steamer algebra. Okay. All right, so that was sort of like our, our exercises for the day. Okay, and let's get back to some a little uh, talking about things at a slightly higher level. Okay, so uh, let's talk about motivic X groups, right? If we want to compute with the K motivic atom spectral sequence, we need to compute X over the motivic steam run algebra, okay? And my, I'll use the notation MP, right, for the motivic homology of a point, right? So you have X over A, MP, MP converges to the um, motivic homotopy groups. Okay? And what you need to know in order to get this spectral sequence started, you need to know the motivic homology or cohomology dually of a point, okay? And you also need to know the k-motivic dual Steinrein algebra, okay? So here's what happens typically, okay? And by typically, I mean for, for a large class of fields, right? Uh, and there, there are exceptions when like the prime P is equal to the char characteristic of the field K, then things get squirrely, right? You know, but, but sort of in general, typically what happens is that the the, that the motivic homology of a point is you take the Milner K theory mod two, okay? So I don't wanna get too much into Milner K theory, um, but let's, so let's just say here that this is an, this, this Milner K theory mod two, this is sort of a, these are arithmetic invariants of your field, okay? And then you just adjoin a, a, an element tau, kind of a free polynomial variable tau. So you have Milner K theory, but then you also have a tau, okay? That's what the homology of a point typically looks like. Okay. And then the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the dual Steinrein algebra typically looks like this big monster here. Okay. And let me talk through these form this formula a little bit to um, wrap our heads around it. Uh, typically at, um, typically at, at, well, okay. So the formulas I've written down here are for p equals two. The formula is at odd primes. So there's a question about odd primes, you know, what's going on at odd primes. Um, so at odd primes, the formulas are known typically, but the formulas are a bit different, especially this, the dual Steinrein algebra, right? The dual Steinrein algebra has a, diff has a somewhat different appearance at odd primes, but it is typically known. Okay, I just want to specialize to p equals two to not write, we're not going to really do anything with the odd primes and I want to write down the, the, the complicated formulas and not use them. Okay, so let's look at what's going on here. Okay, um, classically we had the zetas, polynomial and the zetas. Here motivically we have taus, tau i's, and also xi i's. Okay, so two families of polynomial generators. But there is um, a, a relation, okay, there's a relation that tau i squared equals tau, right? And that tau comes from the coefficients, right? Tau xi plus one plus rho. Rho also comes from the coefficients. Remember rho is our name for the class of minus one in the Milner K theory, okay? Rho and then tau zero xi plus one, that's two of these guys. And then finally another term plus rho, tau i plus one. Okay, so this formula is kind of a nightmare and we need to break it down and think about it carefully if we're really gonna understand it. Okay, what is a reference for the P equals odd case? Well, these things go all the way back to Vavodsky. If you look at, um, oh, what's it? Uh, I, I, I forget the name of the article, but these, for sure, these things go back to Vavodsky. Uh, these formulas have been written down in a bunch of different places. Um, um, uh, a couple of, off the top of my head, a couple of places. Pow Powell wrote an exposition of this that you already wrote down the formulas. Um, Borghese wrote down an exposition of these things where he wrote down the formulas. There's lots. So we, we I, I, I can give you something precise afterwards, um, but they're sort of, 
they're sort of all over the literature by now. I mean, there are mistakes in various places, so you got to make sure you want to get one that's right. But, um, but, but basically, the, the to be actually the odd case is a little bit easier, where it behaves a little bit more like the classical one. Okay, it's this relation is really kind of exotic thing that happens at two. Okay, so when you look at these formulas, what you realize is that the 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 situation really breaks down into two cases. Okay. The first case is where your field contains a square root of minus one. If your field contains a square root of minus one, then, um, then, then this class rho in Milner K theory mod two is zero, right? If minus one is a square, then it's zero mod two in Milner K theory. Okay. And so rho is zero and you have a much simpler formula. It's just that tau i is tau times ci plus one. Okay. That's a much simpler formula. Okay, and then what happens to the x groups over k is that you just need to compute the c motivic x groups. Okay, and right, uh, put in the comments, put in the reference to Vavatsky's, uh, uh, where he wrote Vavatsky's paper where he wrote down the, the dual Sumer algebra. Okay, um, uh, so you need to do the c motivic x and then simply tensor with Milner K theory. Okay, and when I say c, c is my name for any algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, right? It doesn't really matter that it's C, it matters that it's algebraically closed and it's characteristic zero, okay? So, so that's what you, uh, so, so you can, so in other words, you don't really need, this case really boils down to the C motivic case and then there's this arithmetic that shows up also, okay? On the other hand, there's the case where minus one is not, does not have a square root, Okay, and then the class rho is non-zero, and then x is more complicated. So this is the more complicated case, and we'll need to filter by powers of rho and deal with a, a rho box and spectral sequence, and that's something that we'll talk about tomorrow. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the C-motivic atomspect. So what this is telling us here is that we should really need to spend some time with X C and the C motivic atom spectral sequence because the behavior of the C motivic atom spectral sequence is going to kind of dominate this entire case where we're minus square root of minus one, it, it, where minus one is the square root. There will also be arithmetic ph phenomena occurring for a general K in this case, but the first order phenomena are already seen by C. Okay, so we can't skip that step. We have to think about C more carefully. Okay, so. What I've done here is I've copied down the formulas for the cohomology of a point, or the homology of a point, and for the dual Steuern algebra in the case of when k equals c. And on the right, I wrote the analogous computations, the classical ones, so we can see what happens, right? Here we have f2 adjoined tau versus just an f2, okay? And um, we have this, over here we had a polynomial algebra, and here we have two families of, of, of generators, but then we have these relations that intertwine them, okay? So when you look at these formulas, here's how I want you to think about this, okay? Look, this guy here, this dual Steuern algebra is a deformation of the classical Steuern algebra with parameter tau, okay? So what does that mean? That means that if I invert tau, right? To look at the generic fiber, if I invert tau, well, look what happens when you invert tau. When you invert tau, ci plus one is just expressible in terms of tau i squared. Ci plus one is not a generator. You don't even need it, okay? And so when you invert tau, you just get a polynomial, a free polynomial algebra in the tau i's, okay? And it's really the same as the classical Steuern algebra. Okay, so if you invert tau, you just recover the classical Steuern algebra. Okay. On the other hand, if you set tau equal to zero, right, that's the special fiber, you set tau equal to zero, then you have an exterior algebra on the taus and a polynomial on the CIs. Okay, and that turns out, and this thing looks actually quite similar to the odd primary classical Steuern algebra, dual Steuern algebra. Okay, and that's sort of an intriguing link. Okay, so this is how you should think about it. Well, this thing is almost polynomial, except for these taus, that they don't make it quite polynomial. But when you invert the tau, then it does become polynomial. Okay, so what I'm saying here about this deformation is very concrete, very hand, yes, the copro and, and the coproducts coincide. Um, so when I say that, that I, when I invert tau and I get the classical Steuern algebra, yes, the coproducts, that includes the coproducts coinciding. Okay, so I'm, so what I'm saying here is something very concrete and specific and right up on the screen, you can just look at the algebras and you can see the deformation, okay? But this is a shadow of a much deeper phenomenon, okay? So the deeper phenomenon is that cellular, it turns out 
that cellular C-motivic homotopy theory is a deformation of classical homotopy theory, okay? The special fiber of this deformation is the, um, well, yes, the generic fiber is classical homotopy theory. That's what I mean by deformation of classical homotopy theory. The special fiber is an algebraic category of BP star BP co-modules, okay? So BP star BP co-modules is some complicated name that you may or may not understand, but let me just say it's a derived category. It's just a straight up algebraic thing, okay? And so what's happening here is that there's these like, there's these sort of, there's these surprising connections between cellular C-motivic homotopy theory, classical homotopy theory, and this algebraic category of BP star BP co-modules. And this deformations framework, this is really what drives this recent progress that we've made in computing in the computation of the stable, classical stable homotopy groups, okay? So let me, uh, and there, I've listed a na the names of a few people who have worked on various parts of this sort of deformation story. Let me say that something here, this is a great place to end, um, that there is, um, that there is clearly something really important going on in this deformation perspective, okay? And we know about a few examples and we have kind of used those examples to carry out some computations, but there surely is a nice general theory of deformations of homotopy theories, and probably I mean deformations of infinity categories or some derived algebraic geometry type thing, okay, happening here, and that these are special cases of it, okay? So Pistergovsky has done some work. He has produced a family of set types of different deformations, but even Pistergovsky's framework is not general enough. Like there are some examples of deformations um, or things that ought to be deformations that I would like to sort of study from that perspective and in, in order to compute them that don't really fit into any of the kind of like the known frameworks that have already been been developed. Okay, so someone, and there are, I think there are a lot of people at this conference who know a lot more about um, abstract homotopy theory and infinity categories than I do, which is not saying much because I don't really know that much about that stuff anymore. Um, uh, I think this is a nice project for someone to pick this up and really kind of put these examples on a frame, on, on, a, on a solid framework. Okay, all right, um, and then a question, well, let me, let, I, think, I think we should wrap it up here because we're out of time, so I'll stop on that note. Next time, we'll, um, we'll pick up with some more about the C-motivic uh, steamer and algebra and C-motivic computations. Okay, so let, let's first, first uh, thank Dan for, for the talk. Thank you, so I'm, everyone is clapping, of course. So, yes. and, and, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to mention that you, 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 you have noticed that there is some uh, lag in the connection. So it's just to remind that uh, Dan is actually in, in the US and it, it's great that we can make some, some exchanges in US and Europe. So the, the lag is just uh, the trace of that. So it's, it's good to see that we can make conferences like that without uh, tr trying to uh, accommodate the climate and things like that. Okay. So now it's time for, for, for questions, I think. So there is a first yeah. question by by Sean, maybe we can still ask for, to, to that. Yeah, I will. I, I I can stick it around. I'm not in a hurry, so um, so I will go ahead and, and answer questions as many as many as come in. Okay, so um, Sean asked, "What is an example that doesn't fit into the current available frameworks?" So, um, um, I would like to see our motivic homotopy theory as a deformation of maybe C motivic homotopy theory or something like that. Um, I seems to me that that C two equivariant homotopy theory is a deformation of classical homotopy theory as well, um, and I'll talk a little bit more that about that tomorrow if I have time. But um, you know what happens? What happens here in the C motivic case is that basically you know the point is that when you invert tau, when you take the C motivic um, situation and you invert tau, then um, you get um, uh, you, you get classical, okay? So in the R motivic case, if you you could try to invert tau, but the problem is that tau itself doesn't really exist. Tau is sort of more like a periodicity than an actual element, and so inverting tau is a little more com complicated. But Barons and Shaw have have studied sort of tau periodic. R motivic homotopy, and they show how it's connected to C2 equivariant homotopy. So that's another, so, so C2 equivariant homotopy should also be a deformation of R motivic homotopy theory, and so forth. 
so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, so the, the, you know, it's these, you know, it's these examples, right? And then I would like to, there, there are indications that I would like to, you know, you would like to kind of like, you know, somehow, you know, we, we are now seeing C-motivic homotopy theory as you start with classical homotopy theory and you like motivicize it somehow, right? You add this extra grading and you make it more interesting. And I would like to take C-motivic homotopy theory and motivicize it again, right? And add another grading and making it more interesting. Okay, so there, there, there's all, all kinds of examples that there, there are, there is computational evidence that there's all kinds of interesting examples for these sorts of deformations. And of course, you probably want to look at the moduli stack of all possible deformations and the global sections of those things tell you something universal and really powerful and, you know, and, 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 and who knows, right? And now I'm just sort of sh like shooting off buzzwords and I don't really know what I, what I mean by that. Okay, um, sources to, to get started on this idea about deformations. First of all, let me say again, like, I think this is like, this is like a really important direction, like, you know, like that, 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 that we're going to see a lot more results coming out of in, in the coming decade. And so I really like, I think this is definitely something that, 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 that I hope people will look at. So a good source to start with um, to understanding this deformation perspective, there are, there, there's two places to start. Um, first of all, there is a paper of Pistergovsky about synthetic spectra. Okay, that's one good place. And there is an article by Jorge, myself, Krause, and Rika about, mo it's the, the title of the, of the article is Motivic Modular Forms, okay? Um, but it, it, all, it sets up this kind of a deformation um, framework and we use it to construct um, motivic modular forms. Um, and people are, my secretaries in the background, are, um, uh, are, are posting links to those references. Pistergovsky's uh, reference got posted and um, someone can look up the motivic modular forms one also. Okay, uh, let's see here. Mark Levine asks, how does the fact that classical homotopy theory is a deformation of BP star BP modules give new information on classical homotopy theory? Right, co-modules, right. Okay, so here's what happens. Let me, maybe I have a slide later, right? So we'll look at this, we'll jump ahead here. Here, here's a diagram, okay? So this diagram, at the top of the screen kind of describes the relationship. Here's C-motivic homotopy theory, and then you, you know you, you have a functors to classical inverting tau, setting tau equal to zero, you end up in this category of BP star BP co-modules. Okay. So this is an algebraic category, which which means that machines can do all of the work here, right? They can completely understand what's going on here. Okay. And so what you um, what what so you can you can carry out your spectral sequences in great detail by machine here, okay. But then you because you have these functors, you can pull back. You can use naturality and you can pull back differentials along this line, and you can get Adams differentials in the C motivic case from these algebraic differentials, okay. And so you get you get the and these Adams differentials are supposed to have homotopical are supposed to have topological content, but we're extracting them out of machine data. Okay, this doesn't give us all of the Adams differentials, but it gives us most of them. It gives us a lot of differentials. It gives us a huge head start. And then you can, um, once you have that huge head start, you can do ad hoc arguments to find the remaining Adams differentials. And then once you compute these C-motivic groups, then you get these classical groups just by inverting tau. Okay, so it's, it's our ability to, to use machine data at a sort of a bit, the deformation is the theory behind how we can use machine data, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it's a very, it's a nice illustration of sort of like what 21st century mathematics is supposed to be like, right? We have to prove theorems. We have to sort of do some work, right? But the point is that we're, we're, we're proving theorems that allow us to use machines, right? To, to, to find things that we, that, that, that we want. Okay. Um, um, let's see. Have you thought about a criterion for on a motivic spectrum that says that there isn't much difference between um, So no, I have not. I mean, yes, we have thought about that kind of thing um, about 
how about the Komal, the sort of like the motivic invariant of, of a motivic object X would be related to the kind of the corresponding invariant, the, the corresponding topological invariant of the Betty realization, right? So that's what Sean Tilson's asking. It's like, how do motivic invariants correspond to the classical invariants of their Betty realizations? So the answer can be complicated. For example, there's this object S mod tau, okay? Um, and just mean the cofiber of tau, right? It's a two cell complex, a motivic two cell complex, okay? Um, and it's got a very rich theory. I mean, it's algebraic, but it's as, ri it's as rich as BP star BP co-modules, which is rich, okay? Motivically, but topologically, S mod tau is contractible. It's just a point, okay? So you can't see anything about S mod tau classically, okay? So in general, they're gonna be very different, okay? However, Many of the common things that we study, right? What happens is that they're classical, they're E star, what you're writing is E star star of X. They're free, say over E star star. Like say you might study a spectrum X whose cohomology is, S mod tau's cohomology is not free, but you know, KGL, its cohomology is free. And so things whose cohomology is free over tau tend to behave a lot like their classical counterparts. That's probably the best answer I can give there. Okay. <clears throat> are there any purely al algebra geometric techniques used in motivic homotopy theory that are useful in the calculations, or is it merely for formal reasons that deformation of the motivic world helps in calculations? In the latter case, do you expect that once deformation has been made more precise, more abstract deformations could provide additional insights? Also, what's my favorite topological space? Okay. So that's actually that last question is actually a question I can answer. Okay. Um, so let me go back here to the, the deformation. Okay, so um, <clears throat> actually I wanna go back here to these, to these formulas, okay? Here's what I need to do, everything that I do. Here's what I need. I need these two formulas that I put at the top of the screen. All I need is the homology of a point and the dual steroid algebra, and I can get up and running and compute X groups and, and, and carry out an atom spectral sequence. That's sort of all I need to get going, okay? So Vavodsky, establish these formulas, right? And this is diff deep, difficult, hard algebra geometric work, okay? So in that sense, we're sort of, we're using algebraic geometry to when we, whenever we're computing C-motivic homotopy groups and therefore classical stable homotopy groups as well. However, this deformation, one of the consequences of this deformation perspective, okay, is that we can actually, at least, you know, it, because we, we have these, we have this other model for cellular semotivic homotopy theory now, okay, and if we use this more topological model for semotivic homotopy theory, we can get at those computations of Avodsky more naively without ever doing any algebraic geometry, okay, so there was this kind of like, there's this, there's this, this, this there, there's this obvious sort of philosophical question about like why is algebraic geometry somehow useful for computing classical stable homotopy groups, okay? And, and, and this was a question that puzzled us for, you know, a decade or more, two decades, right? And, and, and I think we sort of have an answer now, right? And the answer is that it wasn't the algebraic geometry that was being useful. Okay, it was the deformation that was being that 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 is useful for classical homotopy theory. We probably never would have discovered this whole deformation perspective if it hadn't been for Morel and Davodsky coming along and constructing their algebra geometric categories. Okay, so we absolutely we owe an like irreplaceable debt to those guys to their vision, right, for having led us here. But now with hindsight, right, we see oh, it's not really so much algebraic geometry that's occurring; it's occurring. It's these deformations, and yes, absolutely, other deformations would be interesting. Okay, I am currently using another deformation um, to to learn new things about classical homotopy theory. Apps. That's why I want to look at the moduli stack of all deformations, and you know. Know, and, and so forth, because there must be some sort of universal best thing maybe to work with that tells us every, you know, what we want to know. Okay, um, and finally, my favorite topological space is RP infinity, right? It has to be RP infinity. Um, and we get into why that's, but that's, that's another matter, right? All those, all those steamroll operations and so forth, right? Okay. Um, all right, what else? So Sean Tilson, um, explains that I didn't, he didn't mean Betty realization. He, he meant relating your work over C to other fields like Q. Um, so I think that the, 
the connection there is that you really what you really want to do is you want to work semotypically first. This is the place where there's the least amount of arithmetic occurring, right? And so you um, so you want to sort of sort out the semotypic situation first, okay? And and that's the kind of thing that I'm saying here, for example, right? For example, in this case, when min minus one is a square, computing x groups is just computing semotypic x, right? So just do the semotypic case instead of the general case, right? However, when you get into the atom spectral sequences, things can change. Let me again jump ahead to a slide I was gonna to show tomorrow. But here, here's a picture of sort of like, so the black stuff is semotypic x, okay? And the red arrows are supposed to indicate that there's this extra Milner K theory, okay? And they all go off to the left. That's the way the degrees work out, okay? And it turns out that there can be arithmetic differentials, okay? That like there can be an element from like dr, like tau can support an atom differential that hits something in Milner K theory. Okay, and so that you have to handle well. If it's error mathematic, you have to do something, you know, algebraic, something, you know, um, in something in error. Yeah, you have to do something arithmetic there in order to understand that differential. So that's, I think, the way that you pass from C to Q is you first kind of do the C stuff that gives you the basic framework, and then you have to handle the additional complications from the arithmetic as well. And, you know, Glenn Wilson's work in, um, is a good ex illustration of how this sort of thing goes. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Uh, there's a comment by uh, Jan Kole. RP infinity. Because oh, about back to RP infinity. Okay. You know, RP infinity is sure. It's a K, it's a KZ mod two one, right? It has like, it, it supports every possible um, steward operation, right? Milner used products of RP infinity to kind of detect everything about the steward algebra, right? So our RP infinity is sort of like the fundamental um, example, right? It, it is sort of as complicated as it could be from the perspective of cohomology operations, right? Which is the way I think about spaces. And so it's, you know, as a cell, it's an infinite cell complex. It's got one cell in each dimension and the attaching maps are things you can study, right? This is sort of a very interesting um, example from a lot of different perspectives. <coughs> I'm curious to know who asked that question. It was an anonymous comment, yeah. but anyway. Okay, so it seems no more questions. So that's already 15 yeah. minutes of questions, so that's good. Uh, so okay. now, uh, we will end up now and uh, I, I okay. give you next meeting tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m. It's for the last talk of uh, right. Mark Levin. Okay. okay, thank you again, Dan. Yeah, thanks. Yep, see you tomorrow. Thanks. Yeah, see you okay. tomorrow. Bye. Bye.